Okay, I feel like we can kind of start, and then if more people show up, that's fine. Is that fine? Yeah. That's good. Okay. Um, I guess just to start, uh, oh, there's two screens worth of people. I don't understand how this works. Eh, this is good enough. Okay, um, I guess, like, if you have questions, like, at any point, you can just ask them out loud or in the chat, or, like, there's a raised hand function, or, like, you could do a reaction to put your hand up or something so I can know that. Um, I'm, like, down to answer your questions, like, throughout the seminar, so I'm not just, like, talking to you, like, at you. Um, and the second thing is, I know a lot of you are of different, like, levels, so some of you have, like, I know this is, like, intro BP, but some of you have done, like, BP in high school or no BP or university BP. So just out of curiosity, um, like, who, who here has done, like, no form of BP debate? Okay, so I'm going to take it, kind of. Do you want to explain what the, like, kind of is? Yeah, so I am, like, just joined Carleton's debating club, and when I was on exchange in the Netherlands, I practiced with their debating society, like, two or three times, so I've never, like, debated in a competition or anything like that. I've just done a few practice rounds, so. Oh, okay, you. totally cool, though. Um, do you, but you, do you, like, know the different, like, speaking roles? Yeah. Yeah, more or less. Okay, so I, like, won't cover that then specifically, and I'll assume you guys know that, but if you have questions, just, like, feel free to let me know. Um, okay, so I guess, like, I saw the questions that you guys asked on the forum, and I'll try to cover them. Um, I think in general, I'm just, like, first going to, okay, first I'm going to try and, you know, get split screen to work on my computer. How does it work? Um, okay, so I think first I'm just going to cover, like, some brief changes between, like, high school and university debate for those of you who are like in high school so we're all on the same page and then I'll go over briefly like how to like some tips for success in like opening half of BP and then closing half and then we can discuss a bit on like coming up with arguments in general um and then after that I will like do whatever you guys want uh if, okay cool so we'll just start um okay so just to start, in terms of like a differentiation between those of you coming from like the high school debate circuit, so it's honestly like the exact same on the university circuit. The only minor changes is that speeches are seven minutes in length as opposed to five, and protected time is one minute as opposed to 30 seconds. Um, everything else about the speaker roles that you do um, are the same. The things you're supposed to say in those roles are the same. So the biggest change you'll probably see if you transition from like high school to university will be that because people are talking for longer um, and also because like presumably some people in the university circuit have been debating for a lot longer, then maybe they'll have like more depth to the arguments they make or have time to get through more arguments. So typically this means um, like being opening half on university might be easy as a transition, but sometimes maybe being closing half can be harder because you're used to in high school um, perhaps having a lot more arguments to make on extensions just because like teams talk for shorter periods of time before you so they don't have time to say as much. Um, so that's really the biggest change that you'll see. The other thing is in terms of the types of motions that are set on the university circuit, um, you'll probably see more like I don't want to call them harder motions just like things that are more specific in terms of the topics that are covered. So a lot of like um, edge course for high school tournaments really try their best to set motions that are accessible to people within high school so you can assume that after that point where we assume everyone has a baseline knowledge of graduating from high school that the types of motions you see just might cover different topic areas but other than that all of the like logical or stylistic things um, will be the same so I'll just like cover then general BP debate as you'll see on the university circuit and those of you who are in high school should be able to like pick up on that because it's the same. Um, okay, so I guess just to start off with like opening half. So um, I think some of you asked on the forum like how to win from like opening government, which might be like a side that people fear, uh, or just in general how to prioritize arguments in opening. So I'm gonna go through like a few things that I think are helpful for opening half teams. So the first is just like, I mean, generally to do well on opening half, you want to like be able to generate the most important arguments in the round. We can go over how to select those. Um, but uh, you also want to do what's called like framing of your case. So explain to your judge how it will fit into the round to come. Um, and then like 
doing a lot of preemption as to how your case is going to fit into the remainder of the round. So the first thing we'll talk about is just in terms of like how to select arguments on opening half. So if you get a motion, let's say for example that you get like the debate motion, uh, this house would implement um, mandatory voting. Uh, you can probably think of like a long list of like, uh, maybe not long, maybe you can just think of a list of arguments, right? Um, typically when I'm prepping for debate rounds, uh, I will prepare arguments to come up on both the gov side and the off side. The reason why I think this is important is because if you're like opening government, you probably don't just want to have arguments as or just have ideas as to why it is that mandatory voting is good. You probably also want to know what off will say so that all of your arguments can be in comparison to what they're going to say. Um, so this means that if there's ever a motion where you think that it's like purely good for the government side that you are advocating for, um, and you're unable to recognize any trade off that you're going to have to make during the round, then it probably means that, I mean, either the motion is bad, or that you have a like biased, like, like more likely case, like a biased take on what the motion is, right? So you usually want to think like, what is it that op is going to be more easily winning on? And how will I make an argument that will overcome that? So you can do this in a few ways. Um, usually, like, uh, what I'll say is the most important things to do when evaluating your arguments are on the impact that your argument has in the round. So um, who is affected by it? Uh, like, how are they affected by your the argument that you're making? Um, like, how much are they, like, is their life changing because of it? Um, and then the other thing is on, like, the likelihood of your argument being true. So um, if in the motion, like, this house would implement mandatory voting, maybe you have an argument that says that, like, under the status quo, um, a lot of people are, like, uh, unable to vote for various, like, various um, ways, like, either they are unable to take time off from work to vote or like polling stations aren't accessible. And so maybe you make an argument that in your world, it is very likely that the government now is forced to make it a lot easier for people to vote just because like they have to. And so it's like, so maybe, maybe that is like part of your case line. So you would just want to prove the likelihood of that argument. So why is it likely that when mandatory voting is implemented, the, the next step is for government to make it easier for people to vote? And then the second thing is you want to prove like why that matters. Like even if you prove that now everyone's able to, you have to prove the extent to which things change. So maybe you can say that um, this means people are more represented, but are they proportionally more represented than they are already? And how is that likely to change anything that's happening today? Um, so those are like the two things that you want to think about every time you come up with an argument for your side. So in terms of prioritizing the arguments that you want to make, um, I'd say like a few things. The first is you always want to ask, what is the motion trying to get you to do? Like most ad course will set motions and they will have some type of problem in mind that the motion is solving for, um, or they will like, so either this looks like, um, for instance, maybe you'll have a motion that's like, this house would force fathers to take paternity leave. So does somebody wanna like maybe tell me what they think the problem is the motion's trying to solve for? Any guesses are fine. You can even tell me part of the problem. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so someone wrote in the chat, the overwhelming burden right now that, that is on mothers oftentimes to like take care of kids. So in, in terms of then the types of arguments that you have, um, perhaps you can have an argument that's like um, fathers like taking like mandatory paternity leave might be good for kids. But presumably you don't want that to be your only argument just because if the reason that this motion was set was to deal with like the fact that there's a burden on mothers. Maybe it was also set because of kids, like if it, it presumably is. Um, but if the like largest problem that you want to solve for is a social problem um, towards like women and how that affects them in like multiple facets of life, that probably means you also want to have some type of argument that has to do with solvency for that problem. So in terms of then like how you would prioritize those arguments, I'd say that you should just ask yourself like, what do you think this motion is actually uh, trying to solve for? And then you do what's called like framing, where you frame the context of the world today um, and how this motion fits in. So you can explain that like under the status quo, there is a norm that like a lot of um, like women tend to take off time predominantly more than men to take care of kids. Um, and like this is seen in trends of like stay at home uh, mothers, but like you also see this like in movies all the time, right? With like a lot of like moms taking care of their kids. Um, and you can talk about harms that this leads to, right? Like for instance, um, this often means that like uh, women pre like predominantly um, don't get like as high pay or don't get like 
as many like promotions in their jobs. They're seen as people that are likely to like leave because especially if you're like around the like childbearing age, then you might not be seen by a company as someone who's going to stay long term. So a lot of the the like the the fact that oftentimes mothers will take time off work more so does like influence the types of like policies we then see in the workplace, right? So you can just like frame the context of the round and then um you would like so you can say like this is the problem any like this house woods do a thing motion you can say like this is the problem that we're discussing um here's the cause of that problem so what is the cause of women taking time off work maybe that cause is that like paternity leave um isn't something that's like uh like either maybe the cause is just like men don't want to take time off work um and so the solution then would be to force them to do so so you know you can always ask yourself like what why is it true that they're not choosing to take time off work um and then you talk about why this solution is on net good so that's like generally the like any like motion that's like this house would do anything like how you do it um in terms of like yeah so um okay yeah so the strategic importance of like framing your argument so there's a few things for this um one is like specifically uh okay so in terms of like why it is good to frame your argument i'd say that and in generally like for those of you who maybe it sounds like um like a buzzword so generally framing is just like uh explaining like what your argument is going to address so this can be like a sentence or two to your judge so you're either like explaining how your argument fits into the debate in some way so is it uh directly solving for a problem in the round um like generally it's like what your stance is so the reason why it's important is because if you were like at any team um you want your judge to be in a like a 15 minute deliberation that they have following the round to easily be able to like pick out what is it that this team is bringing to the round um so that's why like we encourage teams to frame their argument this is also true of like back half teams if you're going to give an extension you probably want to explain to your judge very briefly before you even do the extension what is it that your team is going to be doing in the round are you going to be like resolving a clash that was like kind of had in front half but not completely solved for are you going to be addressing a brand new stakeholder that your opening team left out like tell your judge what you're doing at the top of your speech and that should inform the rest of the um arguments that you make later on within the debate um so there can be a few different types of framing so either you can say that you're going to be discussing perhaps like the like morality uh of emotion or maybe you're going to be discussing the um impacts or like consequences of emotion uh or you'll be discussing discussing like um those are like generally it uh so you can frame like your entire speech but you can also frame individual arguments so um for instance if you have a motion that's like this house um would like i don't know create um schools for like lgbtq plus individuals um if you're on gov probably the strategic thing in terms of framing the context of the round that you're talking about is why like schools uh, under the status quo are really bad for these individuals so the amount of like bullying that goes on within them um or like uh and like mental harm that is done to individuals can be something that you discuss whereas if you're on off you're probably going to flip that and you're probably going to say that when you create these schools for individuals that's bad for their interactions with people later on and maybe you say the problem isn't specifically with schools but interactions with people in the general world and so it's like the like the the way in which you frame your problem will probably inform your arguments because on gov your arguments are probably going to be why is the school specifically good for individuals and on op your arguments are probably going to be the school is not good maybe here's an alternative solution that we should do or here's why it makes it far worse for when people go out to interact in the outside world um so that's like why you would want to just like briefly define like what is the problem that your argument is trying to then solve for um so i'd say that like if you are opening government in a debate round uh there are like a few important things so the first is in terms of like modeling um this is something that like i don't know this is something that like i think a lot of like uh newer debaters you'll see them do things like this motion takes place in western liberal democracies um don't do that so every time you have like a, a model to a debate there should be a reason for it right um so this means that each step that you are discussing your model you should explain why you decide for it to be that way and also why the motion itself justifies the interpretation of a model that you have so that teams know that it is fair and a judge can evaluate it as fair um so a common debate that requires a model is like this house would implement a parenting test um this is a motion that can probably be won or lost on the model so 
you would want to go through like each step of your model and you can say like um, questions such as how much would it cost? How do you take it? What types of questions are on it? What happens if you fail? Um, things like these were all want to be addressed within the model. Uh, on like a several, similar level, if you had a motion like uh, the motion that we like I previously brought up on like mandatory voting, you'd want to just say like what are the consequences to when you don't vote? That's probably important. Um, so, you know, you just want to like, and you want to justify why you're, you're valid, in, valid in making those the consequences of your model. Um, so if you have like a motion that's like this house would, uh, I don't know, legalize all drugs and you define drugs as like ibuprofen, that's like very unfair and probably a bad interpretation of the motion. Um, versus if you're like, we model this debate as like any drug that's either like over the counter, whatever you want it to be. Um, then like it's probably uh, like, probably better. Um, in terms of like the types of stances that you should take, um, like you'll see teams often take like, I don't know, I'd say that probably strategic for you to take like a harder line stance within a debate. So if you have a debate motion that's like, this house would uh, like legalize euthanasia um, and you are on the government team, you could model it and say that we will allow it. Like you probably want to define the cases in which you allow it. So perhaps on Gov, you say that we will allow uh, euthanasia in cases where there is no type of like uh, cure or treatment for a condition that someone has, um, and there never will be one. Or you can say like a probably a better interpretation of this is um, even in cases where potentially in the future there we will develop some type of cure here's why we should still uh, enable patients to make this decision. And so that's probably a harder line stance. And the reason why I encourage teams to take a harder stance in terms of the uh, arguments that you will then make is because it's a lot easier to follow through with them, right? It means that when teams like bring up um, refutation to your case or like question you on anything, um, you won't be contradicting yourselves because you don't have like, like a, a lukewarm take on it. But it also means you're going to reach like higher impacts in the round when you take like a, a higher a higher stance and usually taking a higher burden also means that it's a lot harder for like your back half to do well because you've already taken on trying to prove the hardest thing in the round and your judges will credit you credit you for that um okay uh yeah so it's like most things that are probably important for front half so i guess just like in terms of how to like ensure that you will do well in a debate from opening there are a few things so one is ask yourself like you all have presumably been closing half in a debate um so this means you know how like when people give an extension they need to like weigh that extension against your opening half's case uh this can be in various ways right they will either weigh in terms of like we help a different actor or our problems are solving for the long term and opening half solves for the short term whatever it is they're going to do that type of weighing so you just want to also do that but on front half so this means thinking about how is it that my back half can extend off of my arguments? And either you can like steal those cases, right? So maybe in the deputy speaker, you can be like, also this like argument my partner gave in terms of the short term cross applies to the long term, here's how. Um, or you can do a lot of weighing as to why this motion should be most about the short term and why you should prioritize effects that it has on the short term. So that even if your back half like discusses an argument on the long term and justifies it, they still have to also then go against like the weighing that you did on why we should put a priority on the short term. Um, so I'd say just like think about all the things that closing does and do those first in opening half. That is going to be helpful for your case. Um, and then just if you like kind of like frame the context of the round, solve some type of problem and explain why you're doing a good thing, you'll probably be doing well within the debate. Um, kind of just like the most important things on forming arguments is just like don't uh, like don't skip over proving why things are true. So anytime you make some type of broad-based uh, claim, always justify why that claim is true. Um, and then another thing is, especially if you're on opening half, um, anytime you make an argument, don't just prove that argument via like examples. I mean, this is true for all teams in a debate, but these are really easy ways to which like a back half can extend off your case by doing like analysis on an example that you bring or analyzing an argument that you kind of said but didn't fully develop. So if you are opening half, always make sure that when you're making a claim that you analyze why that claim is true and you don't just give an example saying that it's like it was true in one case, but analyze why that example is true in that one scenario. Why would that be likely true in other similar scenarios that you're discussing? Um, okay, uh, I'm not 
sure. Do you guys have other questions on like opening half of a debate? Okay, yeah, we can discuss uh, prep time really quick. So I think that probably, um, okay, so the most important thing in any position that you're in in the round, but especially front half where like you want to make sure that you get through all the important arguments in the round is to focus on the case that you're going to bring. So in terms of how to prepare, the thing that I would suggest is when you get a motion, spend like three minutes or so independently prepping without talking to your partner about it. Like you can ask them a question if you're confused, um, but like independently brainstorming arguments for that motion on like either side of the round. Um, the reason why this is important is you might like see the motion differently and that's, uh, that's okay. In fact, it can be good because you can like realize early on that maybe other teams will also see the motion differently and have a discussion on like the way that you should be interpreting it. Um, but it also means that you'll probably focus on different types of arguments as opposed to getting to like a group think mindset. So I'd say independently think about arguments for like two to three minutes and then just like list off your arguments to your partner. Um, after that point, you probably want to try and like think through the importance of different arguments that you guys had come up with. Um, and like, uh, this will probably take you like, I don't know, like another like four to five minutes. Like why does the arguments that you bring matter? Um, why are they going to be like beating the other teams within the round? Um, so those are the types of questions that you want to ask yourselves. And then you can like select the arguments that you're going to end up running um, on opening half. Um, I'd say at that point, if you're like halfway into prep time, perhaps whoever is like first speaking can start to like plan out their speech if they're the type of person that likes to write down more things. Um, I'd say if you're second speaking, you should still try and continue to come up with arguments that you can add in. So either this is thinking of new ways or different ways that you can explain the points your partner's already prepping, and then you should tell them to them because it's really good to like front load all of your material. So like if you can win a debate in the prime minister speech, that's good for your team, right? So if you're the deputy prime minister and you think of new ways to explain why a point is true, or if you can think of new reasons why that point matters, then tell your partner and tr try to have them get through as much of that material as they can. Um, but you should also be writing this down because, and then listening to their speech and noting where they don't finish doing that and write down. And then you should be filling that in, in terms of your like rebuilding, um, just make sure you get through all of it. So I'd say you should spend the majority of your time uh, prepping new types of arguments. I'd say maybe if you're like 10 minutes into prep and you are like the deputy speaker, you can spend some time thinking of um, arguments for the other side and how you will refute those. If you notice that your refutation can be um, integrated somewhere within your case, you can also like tell that to your partner and you could have it as like preemption to what will be the like opposition case. That could be helpful. Um, so this means that your case is always going to be like comparative to what other teams will say. Um, and then I'd say in the last like minute or two minutes of prep, you wanna just like re-clarify the model that you have for the debate because um, you wanna make sure that it's not like contradicting any of the arguments you have um, and that it's like only strengthening them. Uh, so that's in general how I would say that you should like focus your prep time on opening half. It's just like thinking of all of the types of arguments that would be good. Um, this would also be like brainstorming a list of all of the like people that would be affected by emotion or places that would be affected and doing like actor analysis of that um, or thinking of like, are there economic implications of emotion? Are there social implications? Are there like environmental implications? Whatever it be. Um, so that's like generally what you'd want to do in opening half. I'd say in closing half, you probably still want to do that. So if you're prepping and you are back half of a debate, it's important that you think of all the arguments because perhaps like opening doesn't cover the most basic arguments. And so like, that's probably a win for you. You can just like make them. Um, but even if they don't, they don't, uh, even if they cover them, opening half teams don't always cover them. And we'll get into this, but they don't always cover them like super well. So you might be able to just make those arguments, but better. Um, and then on back half, you just want to like keep thinking of like anything, you know, that can relate to emotion that perhaps you can make into your extension. Um, okay. Was there another question in terms of opening half or was that it? That's all I see in the chat.
I'm gonna go with that's good for now because I don't see anything. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna th talk about like closing half in the debate. So probably um, I'll spend most of this on like extensions because I think that like um, we can go over how to do things like whip speaking. I didn't really go that much into deputy speeches either, but like the most important thing in winning around is probably first and foremost having a case. And then after that, like, you know, coming, becoming better at like reputation to other teams um, and like weighing your case into the round. But most important is that you have a case. Um, okay, so how do you come up with extensions if you're back half of a debate? So um, obviously, like, the first is just like if there are unused arguments that you like have that are very obvious that you think are good, run those arguments. So probably the most uh, important thing is what happens when your opening team like covers most arguments that are like easy to grasp or like basic arguments. Um, someone asked in the other chat, like, what do you do when like all the arguments you can think of are taken? Um, so we'll probably cover this mostly, but I can go over some other like extraneous things. Um, so one thing I'll say, if you're a closing team, while your opening half is talking, take notes on their case and like try and poke holes into it. So every time they're like going through an argument, be writing down how they explain that argument. And then ask yourself if you were like a judge, because um, like as an extension speaker, you kind of want to think like a judge and fill in the gaps that they're currently missing. So ask yourself, like, do you believe that their argument is fully true? Have they done enough to prove the claims that they are making? If the answer is no, then unclosing, even if those arguments were given, if they weren't believable the first time, then you can say that like your extension is going to be on actually proving why the arguments that an opening team like asserts are true. And you can be beating them on the fact that you actually explain um, like why that argument is true and relevant to a round. The second thing you can ask is, even if they make a claim, so even if they say that like um, more people will get to vote, have they proved the importance to that argument? Do they give any impacts on why a judge should value that argument or weigh it into the debate? Um, again, if they have not done that, then part of your extension could be on like impacting why a point matters, because it's really not going to be judged or weighed all that much until it's given importance. So that can also be noted to you um, as an extension. Um, another thing, if you're like very stuck and your opening half has done a really good job of constructing their arguments, is trying to question like your cross bench. Uh, so like if you're like closing gov, like maybe like opening opposition and think of reputation to their case. Sometimes refuting teams can be like flipped into positive constructive material. So like try and like maybe uh, opening off is trying to like point a question at the government case and maybe they have like some uh, alternative that they want to prove or something. So your extension could be like trying to just like disprove that team and you can just frame it as positive matter. Um, so thinking of reputation can help you with that. Um, other ways to do extensions would be to question like maybe an opening half there's an unresolved question like does some argument do like more harm or good um, to X group of people and maybe it's gone like back and forth on both sides or maybe each team is arguing for assisting, but with different groups of people. So then the question becomes, uh, who should be more prioritized within the scope of that debate? And so your extension could be on, like you can have an extension that is like a point on characterizing the like problem that we're talking about and why that leads itself to a priority on a certain group of actors. And so proving why the unresolved clash and opening half should fall to your side on the basis of it being more directly linked to the motion um, and like, so therefore like you should win on like the weighing of that case. So that can be like another way that you um, try and like think of ways to address problems in a round, even if you don't have like uh, actual constructive arguments. Um, sorry, someone asked a question. Oh, okay. Um, so in terms of things such as like remodel, in back half or someone asks like when knifing your front half is justified. So I'd say in general you're told to avoid knifing your front half. That being said, um, if they are just like objectively incorrect, I think that it would be justified for you not to take the same stance as them. Uh, like if they are like just like, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example of 
Um, yeah, but like, if, yeah, just like if they are like completely incorrect, I, I'd say it's probably okay to go against them. But a, a better way to do this than directly knifing your front half, because like, I don't know, it's not really seen as like that nice of a thing to do. Um, also, like some judges will discredit you for doing it, even if it is justified. So probably the better way to go about it as opposed to knifing them is to just discuss like another interpretation. So you can see that like, either this motion can be interpreted as like your opening said, or it can be interpreted in another way. And that is the case that you're going to talk about because you think that that it's like more relevant or whatever. Um, so like someone asked about like how to, if you're allowed to like counter model from like closing opposition. Um, I'd say that like you can, you just have to, anytime you give a counter model, you want to prove why it's like mutually exclusive and better than what the government team is saying um, and uses the same amount of resources. So if you're like closing off and you're counter modeling for the first time, uh, because your opening team didn't and you want or they did and you want a different one um, You can but make sure that you address all those questions Especially because like opening government can't engage with you and those are probably key things that they'd be refuting you on So just like think through that. So for instance, if you have a motion that's like um, This house believes that like uh, this this house would like significantly tax vacant homes Maybe on off you have some other type of model that you want to do to deal with like um housing shortages or like cost of living um that's fine but like explain why it uses like similar amount of resources either like political capital or economic capital as gov um okay uh yeah someone had also previously asked on like how to take like strategic not like let's say you, that you know that you're not winning because i don't know let's just say that you do uh, someone asked how to take like strategic twos or threes in rounds. So in terms of that, um, I'd say it's about like prioritizing the like teams that you want to beat. So if you're like closing half and you know that you have an, you don't have an extension that will be your opening, um, but you have like some new thoughts, then you want to prioritize, uh, especially like in your web speech, just like making sure that you like fully refute other teams and prove how your extension helps you in refuting them. And then you can maybe spend less time trying to outweigh your opening, especially if you know that you never will. So sometimes it's just about spending time on the things that you definitely want to win um, and not wasting your time on clashes that you know you're not going to win. That's like generally how you would take like a strategic two or three in a round. Um, it's just like knocking out some team. So either you're like, I'm just gonna target this weak closing op team and I'm just gonna refute them a lot and make sure that you're above them. Uh, and then you have strategically taken a three. Um, so that's like something that you can do is just like point out which team do you think you reasonably can beat. Um, okay. Um, I don't know if you guys had like other specific questions. Okay, it's a good question. Um, so, yeah, okay, so whipping strategies, yeah, I can cover that briefly. Um, okay, so in terms of the format of a whip speech, um, there are, like, different ones, so you all might have seen this in practice or in, like, tournaments or whatever, so some whip speakers will go, like, team by team, and they will just, like, let's say you're, like, the closing gov whip speaker, maybe you will, like, refute closing off, opening off, and then you will, like, weigh your case over your opening or in some order like that. Um, another strategy is to like have themes generally covering the round and then within those touch on various different teams. Um, I'm not gonna say that one is better than the other just on the basis of like do what you're most comfortable with and what you find easier. And sometimes it can change depending on the round. So if you think that the entire round is under a uh, very similar theme, so let's say like all speakers in a round generally have an argument having to do with like some type of economic gain and then other speakers talk about like some type of social change. Maybe you have themes on both of those that arguments fit within. Um, or if like you're someone who perhaps like it can be easier if you're like, if it's harder for you to conceptualize how arguments fit into different themes, just to go like team by team um, and like do reputation to those teams. Um, so I'd say like you can go back and forth and practice either of those uh, and do what you like better. Um, but in, um, I can briefly go through like how, um, so like how you should, how you can win in either of those themes. Uh, so 
no matter the structure of your whip speech, you have like one goal, which is just to win. So how do you do this? Um, so one thing is making sure that you have an extension that you can whip, that it's like something that's like probably like the biggest thing I'll say, like oftentimes you'll see web speakers that perhaps give a nice speech, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily winning. So you have to have like some content to go off of. So um, a few strategies for how to like use your web speech. So one thing I'll say is make sure that the extension you're giving is in clash with other teams in the round, because it can be really helpful if you were like closing gov and let's say you have a good opening government team. Um, you also want to be like, like if opening up like fully refutes opening off, you probably also want to be refuting them or also be refuting closing off. So having like being able to use your extension to refute teams um, can be like helpful in doing that. So I'd say in terms of like a strategy to whip, like ask you who you're currently losing to and try to like beat them. Um, another strategy is like asking like who is beating you in the round and why and trying to outweigh them. So probably like if you want like an easy whipping style to start with, perhaps you can start your speech with just like rebuilding your extension if there was like reputation given to it and then discussing its importance within the round and addressing the motion and then weighing it over your opening. So you can say like our opening half discuss this problem, but here's why our extension is necessary for either proving that the argument opening gave is true or here's why our argument affects a greater number of people and therefore is way more important or here's why our argument is more likely to actually be true so even if our opening half's argument um had a very high impact we don't know for sure that it will ever occur so you should weigh our extension over theirs on the basis of likelihood and that it's more likely to succeed even if the impact is lower we know that it will occur so you can do that type of weighing to kind of like weigh your extension of your opening uh and then for like the latter half of your web speech you could go through like your cross benches uh, extension and why it is that like and refute it, but you should do like layered refutation here. So first disprove it. And then you can tell your judge like, even if you believe their extension, here's why you should weigh uh, our case over theirs. And now you're proving why your partner's material is more impactful than the material that like uh, the other team gave. And if you do that for both of the teams on the opposing bench, you've now proved collectively why your team should be weighing over them. Um, so in effect, you've just like weighed your case over the other three teams in the round. So that's like generally what you want to do. Um, in terms of staying confident, um, I think you just need to really believe in your case. Like that's just what kind of what you got to do. It's just like lean into your case, fully believe it for like seven minutes, and then you can go back to disbelieving it. Um, but that's probably probably what you need to do. Um, the other thing is like, if you're a whip speaker, take very good round, uh, good notes on the duration of the round, because it can then be really helpful to like have specifics on where you're differentiating from other teams um, and like not miss out on important parts of their case. The other thing is, I see a lot of teams take a lower burden where they're like, try and refute the weaker stance of another team. So in terms of like whipping your case against others, you all try and like take the best parts of their material and prove why you're beating those instead of the worst parts of another team's case, because uh, like a judge is also going to be looking at the better parts of someone's case. So you want to like try and prioritize, especially if you have only seven minutes to cover an entire round, prioritize why you're beating them at their best. Um, okay. Do you have another question? Okay. Um, okay, I'll deal with the first question, which is pretty much about how to do like preemption. Um, okay, yeah, we can cover all of these. Uh, okay, so, okay, um, I'll give you maybe an example motion will help with this. So let's say I have the motion, this house prefers a federal jobs guarantee to a universal basic income. So pretty much like, do you give do you tell people you can have a job if you want one? Or do you like give everyone uh, some type of universal amount of money? Maybe it's taxed away for rich people, but everyone just gets money and does what they want with it. So if you were like the prime minister, presumably you can talk about benefits to people having a job and you can go on and on about like the types of fulfillment that they get from 
uh, having a job and like maybe like extraneous benefits that it has to other people because perhaps their job is like helpful to society writ large. Um, but in terms of being preemptive, you want to think about like what are the types of arguments that OP might bring up in terms of why um, a UBI is good. So maybe OP will talk about people, um, I don't know, getting to do what they want with their money, let's say, or the fact that not everyone will in, like enjoy these types of jobs that are given by the government. Uh, perhaps with a UBI, people can do things that will be more useful and governments aren't good at like allocating different types of work, um, et cetera. So that means if you think that the biggest argument on OP will be something in terms of people being like independent, getting to do what they want and getting more enjoyment, then on Gov, to preempt that, you could like work that into your speech. You can have an argument about why jobs will be good for an individual and their personal fulfillment. And you can say that even if on OP, uh, te like teams discuss why having money is good for getting to do things, um, you can maybe frame the problem preemptively so that op has a higher burden so you can say that like maybe the problem is a lot of people want to work but they can't let's say you are like um someone who has a criminal track record um and you're now not being hired by people it'd be really good if the government were to guarantee you a job so that you can start to build up your resume again to like work again if that is what will fulfill you right and sure maybe a ubi will give you some money but that doesn't help solve the problem you have which is the lack of a resume um, to get a job or maybe the lack of basic like job skills training that you need in order to get the type of job fulfillment that you're trying to seek out. So maybe a UBI doesn't solve for it in those cases. Um, and you can do that similarly with other things. So if you're talking about what are the root causes of like poverty in the first place and how is it that these jobs can help. So just compare all the impacts you have to the impacts that you think will be likely from a UBI. That's probably the best way to be preemptive. So perhaps you have an argument on like why um, jobs are good at solving for like, perhaps these federal jobs are good because it means that the government will be focused on large scale projects. So maybe the government will employ people to be like child, uh, like take care of children, right? You'll like start a, like a childcare center and then you'll employ people to work there. Um, and you can discuss why this has extraneous benefits because now it means that like stay at home parents can now go work and they can have somewhere to like leave their kids thanks, thankful to this like job guarantee. Um, so you could say that on the comparative, even if you gave people money for a UBI and they were able to use that money to like uh, pay um, a babysitter or some type of like someone to care for their kids, uh, perhaps it's a lot cheaper on mass if you have like one childcare center that's able to watch out over a large number of kids. Um, and so maybe that's a better solution. Or maybe you say that's also really good for like child interaction if kids are able to like meet other other people. And so a large daycare center could be better than just like you individuals paying for it. Um, or maybe you say that the amount of money they get from a UBI won't be enough. So it's better that the government is able to start up these types of programs. Um, so that would be like a way of being preemptive. Um, to the person who asked the question, is that like good? Or do you have more questions on that? That's good. Okay, cool. Um, okay, the next question is on points of information. Um, how do you craft one and what do you do if it isn't taken? Um, okay, so if someone is speaking after you and they don't take your POI, there is not much you can do about that. Um, that is up to like, if they take another team instead of you, um, that's just like life that happens. If they don't take anyone, that's up to like judges discretion on how that should um, hurt them. So like most uh, judging manuals say that you should consider it as if a good one with a POI was given to them. Um, if you speak after the person talking and they didn't take your POI, I mean, you can like point that out. So let's say you were like closing gov and you have a completely new case that opening off doesn't have time to respond to. You could say that like, you note that they like, that it is, new but that you would have given them the chance to engage had they taken your point i mean that's like maybe not the nicest thing but like you can say that that's fine that's that's deep uh so that's like really in terms of if they don't take you like not much else you can do um okay in terms of crafting a poi so i think that like the thing i will recommend is write out your point fully before you say it so a lot of people will be called on and then they'll like be like oh i don't remember what i was gonna say like whatever so it's good if you like write it down and you and your partner can like look it over um and you can do like two things so one is have try try and strategically use points of information um so like for instance uh 
if like let's say you were opening government and your case is being ignored probably a strategic thing for you would be to like poi closing off and point out how the case you already gave engages with the material that they're giving so you can be like uh our first argument on whatever refutes the case you're making and so now you're like bringing back up your own material and you're proving how it weighs over their case so that'd be like how to be strategic with the points you're given um i can't really give like a be all end all for how to construct a good POI. I would just think of like, think about the thing that you're trying to do. Like, don't just like say something because you think that it'll make a speaker upset or that it will bother them. Don't give a, like, I'd say generally don't give a POI that's like, give me an example of this thing because like, I've seen that happen before. And it's just like, usually judges don't like assume people need to like have examples offhand. So try and like have some end goal in mind. So whether it be like, just purely refuting their case if you think that that's what you're like losing on but focus on the thing that that team is strongest at and try to like you can give them a point to try and like take that down um or try to bring up your own material um yeah uh sorry okay um in terms of note taking mm, um, I feel like note taking might be help. Okay, would it be helpful to like do a share screen with like a whiteboard or should I just like talk through note taking? I don't know, it would be easier. Um, a whiteboard would be cool. Okay, well, I'm gonna figure out how to do that. Um, okay. Oh, wait, if I give you host status, you can, oh, wait, no, you I, can do that. it's all good. Yeah, I think I got it. Um, okay, let's, let's do this. Uh, okay, so, can I get the chat back up? Okay, um, so for those of you who asked uh, about note taking, have you, like, heard of or seen notes of people, like, quote, unquote, flowing a debate round? like a yes or no would be good like what styles of notes do you currently take <laughs> messy notes okay uh okay yeah i guess i can go over Okay, um, I guess I can go over a few different ways to take notes. So I realize now this might be annoying to draw on, but I'll figure it out. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, so one style of note taking is called flowing, which is just where you like take points on like, let's say the prime minister made like two, they made three arguments. And then you're like the leader of opposition Maybe you'll do like refutation here. And then you will give your own arguments. Uh, um, and then you can like draw arrows of like, um, okay, we're gonna pretend that I understand how to use this drawing thing, uh, whatever. But do you see like you can take notes in like different columns um, across a page as to like how the things that like different speakers say connect. Um, a lot of people, as you guys are referring to in the chat, call this like the way they take notes as a judge. So it's just like going through the order of events that happened in a debate. Um, so I think that for me personally, I take notes differently depending on where I am in the round. And this also might depend on like, um, if you're delivering like a constructive speech versus like a second speech. So if you're like the prime minister, like do whatever you want for your notes. Like you can have maybe a piece of paper with each different argument that you're going to give. Um, whatever is like, helps you become more organized. Uh, if I'm like, you can just use this drawing tool. Okay, yeah. If I'm like um, a deputy speaker, the way I oftentimes take notes is I'll have like two pieces of paper. Uh, why did they make this drawing tool so hard? Okay. Um, You can just pretend that this is paper. Okay. 
Um, so I will take notes by like on one piece of paper, writing like here, I'll write like the PM's points. Um, and then here I will write down like all of my responses. Um, that's like for me, like this, yeah. Um, and then on another piece of paper, I'll do the same, but it'll be like the points that my partner made followed by um, responses. But then I'll use like different colors. So perhaps I'll write down the things that my partner says in one color and then in another color, things that I wanna add on to their points. Um, so like for me, that's uh, the most structured way so that if I go up to give a speech, I can clearly do like reputation on a case that was made and then um, rebuilding where I can see like what my partner said, things that I wanna add, but also perhaps reputation from another speaker that I wanna respond to. Um, so that's like generally the way that I take notes, which is like blowing, but on maybe different pieces of paper. Uh, I think that that's a good note taking style. Um, in terms of what specifically to write down, um, I realized that I don't, that this whiteboard is like too hard for me to use, so I'm gonna not use it. Uh, real sorry to everyone who wanted to see visuals. Um, I think that in terms of what to write down, you wanna write down like the title of the argument, but you also wanna write down like the analysis that teams are given. So like a lot of teams, and this kind of has to do with someone who was like, Oh, where is this? I have to scroll all the way back up. Oh yeah, someone was like, what happens if teams focus on the worst thing that you're saying? Or like, what happens if a team is just purely refuting uh, the general type of argument that you said, but not what you specifically said? So that's why it's important to like write down, not just the title of someone's argument. And like, if you've heard the argument before, assume you know what they're going to say, but like write down the reasons why they're explaining that their point is true. So you can take down their actual like mechanisms that they are giving. Um, and then also write down like what the impact is of their case. Um, so those are like notes that you should be writing down. Um, I'd say, yeah, that's like generally like you would just want to write down more. Honestly, like in terms of a good note taking style, like that works for me, but I know that a lot of people take notes differently. So to whoever said they have their own personal note taking style, if that works for you, then like keep doing it. Like I'm not going to tell you not to. Um. Yeah, no worries. Bye, James. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure if someone else had a question before because um, this chat, like, I don't, I don't, I'd have to scroll all the way up. So if you had a question previously, you can just like retype it. That would be chill. Okay, um, if you don't have any, if no one has specific questions about like structure things, I guess. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Um, so like how to generally prep, prep for different types of motions that you'll see at tournaments. So, um, okay. So in terms of like, yeah, like reading the news or like some people, yeah. Okay, usually tournaments will only have like one, generally one, um, like international relations motion. So obviously like the way that the debate world is kind of set up is in a way that's like skewed towards people who have knowledge on like current or historical events over like obviously other subjects are cool but like if your knowledge is in like like mathematics like unfortunately debate is uh, skewed against you. Uh, I'm sorry but you know it probably means you're a logical person. Um, so I'd say in terms of preparing for tournaments, yeah, like keeping up like generally what's going on in the world is good. But um, another thing is just like, most motions won't force you to know a ton about a topic. So like, um, if you, yeah, a moment of silence for math majors, I, yeah, I agree, Sophie. Um, but if you like, so if you have a motion that's like on any specific country and you don't know anything, um, I think that's probably, the maybe the thing that I can help you with most like a lot of times maybe you won't know specifics but try and like generalize how arguments you're making apply elsewhere so if you have a motion that's like this house would apply economic sanctions on x country and you know nothing about it just try and think of general reasons why sanctioning could be good and then you can make that into your case even if you don't know anything about the area they're talking about obviously that's like worst case scenario but still good to like understand that if you ever are like very confused by motion prior to getting to the step of like being stressed, like 
go one step back and just like cross out any names of places and replace it with like general variables and then try and think of arguments that you can generally use. So in terms of preparation then for different motions at tournaments, something that I would encourage teams to do is, I mean, one thing is just a lot of practice. Like I think a lot of speakers will get better when they go over different types of motions again and again. Like, I don't know. I, I honestly think that like doing debate rounds and then like losing and hearing good arguments is like a very good way to get better. But in terms of like prepping for different types, you can go to like um, Hello Motions, I think is a site that has a bunch of different motions and you can kind of like look up, like you can type in the search bar like art and then see art motions or like social movements and see motions have to do with that and get a general idea of it. And then like maybe at your practices or with your partner, you can like generally discuss them. Um, another thing that you can do is just try and think of general arguments for and against, like things that come up a lot. So for example, um, you might see a lot of debates that have to do with things like uh, raising awareness on issues. And you can like just try and brainstorm like general ideas as to why raising awareness is good. Um, and you can think of like why it's good in different contexts. So perhaps raising awareness on like social issues or raising awareness on like health issues uh, or whatever it is, like think about why that's good and think about like how you do it. Um, so another thing could be like, perhaps you think of uh, like, what are ones that come up a lot? Perhaps there's like a lot of motions that come up on like economics and perhaps that can be scary to people. So something I might encourage you to do is like, take a 15 minute YouTube video on microeconomics and a 15 minute video on macroeconomics and generally learn what things like supply and demand are um, and like, that general video will probably take you through a lot. Um, I guess, like, I don't know. If you, like, is there a specific type of motion that is harder for you that I can go over or just like anything in general? Okay, uh, not getting a response. So I'm gonna say that if you want to just prep in general, like go through different types of motions and practice those and then hopefully similar ones come up. And then if there's ever a motion that comes up that you're very confused by, um, after the round, like no matter how you do, uh, think about it again sometime in the future and then you'll be more prepared next time it comes up. Um, I honestly think that is the best way to learn. Uh, another way could be like if you're in a round and you don't understand it or like there aren't that great of arguments, like try and like maybe look up, you can either look things up or like, um, I don't know, like ask other people at the tournament or like within your school, like what they think and try and incorporate like new ideas um, into that motion. Because even if like, even if you went around, that doesn't necessarily mean that you make the best arguments. So you can always ask other people. That's like generally how I'd suggest um, learning more. Uh, if you have like a more specific question on a different type of motion, I might be able to help you more, but otherwise like very general. So I'm not sure how to address the question. Um, I guess also to like whoever asked that, if you have like a specific type of motion that you're like trying to prepare for and confused by, I guess you can just like message me at a later point. I have like, I can probably like give you materials to have to do with like something more specifically that you're trying to prepare for. Um, okay, does anyone else have any specific question? If we're okay. done with the seminar soon, um, yeah. I just wanted to let people know that um, we technically speaking have a bit more space in the um, in the debate. So if you last minute want to debate, feel free to send in the Google form. We're going to take like a quick like five minute break 
So like send in that Google form like ASAP and then we'll like try to slot you in and then like be on the QC Discord server. Um, and at around like, I'd say like 7.15, 7 and 10 ish to 7.15 ish, we're gonna like post the draw and then the motion. Are we doing that, the debates on Discord too? Yes. Okay, cool. So we'll be on the QC Discord channel. Um, just to like close out, just want to say a massive thank you to Ruth for taking out the time to do a seminar for us all and teach us lots about VP debate. Um, so thank you so much, Ruth, for volunteering to do this. Um, it was a great seminar. Really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. So we if you want to... Oh, look at all thanks, your thanks guys for coming. <laughs> wow. I like the virtual pause. <laughs> um, um, the link to join the Discord server is sent in the group chat too. So feel free to check that out. Okay. And if you do want to debate last minute, let us know when we can slot you in. Okay. Thanks guys. All right, see you soon.